Our study shows that these different emotional behaviors can predict the development of different health problems in the long run. Senior author Robert Levinson said, for years we've known that negative emotions are associated with negative outcomes for health. So why is everyone taking the piss out of Noel Edmonds? He's just saying the same. Oh, he presents a game show. This is a scientist. But truth is truth is truth, whoever says it. And bollocks is bollocks, whoever says it. However many letters they have after their name. He says, um, this is one of the many ways that our emotions provide a window for glimpsing important qualities of our future lives. It's freaking hilarious. So, how does all this work? The postage stamp consensus has a version of reality even though quantum physics shows it to be nonsense, an aversion of the human body, which is, uh, and I'm being optimistic, in the Stone Age. When you look at um, reality, um, it's dominated, at our level of it anyway, by electricity and electromagnetism. That's the way information is communicated it's the way thoughts work. I mean, how does the brain work with electricity? How does it communicate with electricity? How does DNA communicate with electricity and frequency and vibration? Um, Nikola Tesla, the uh, a real scientist who died penniless in a hotel room in New York in 1943 because he was a real scientist challenging the postage stamp, and who, um, in effect, gave us our, 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 the basis of our electrical systems to this day, he was um, creating technology and showing it to work that was tapping into these electrical, electromagnetic levels of reality and turning it into usable warmth and power, which those behind the, uh, the power industry did not want because, basically, they could, they, once the, the machine was made that, that was interacting and, and with the uh, electromagnetic electrical level of reality and turning it into usable warmth of power, once you had the, te the uh, machine, they didn't cost anything because it was just using natural um, phenomenon to give you your power. It's the last thing that the power companies want or wanted. That still wanted. Uh, and that's why he ended up uh, penniless in, in a uh, New York hotel room in 1943. And by the way, those same forces that are saying we must get rid of fossil fuels because of global warming, that hoax, they're the same people who are suppressing this free energy technology that Tesla was using um, in the first part of the 20th century. And he knew that um, everything was vibration, everything was energy, everything was uh, electromagnetism at our level of reality. And so... Um, to give you an example, it's come out actually only in the last couple of weeks. Scientists said it, so it must be true. Um, which is, is a classic example of what I'm talking about. This is the headline. You better be leave it. Dancing hares lead bumblebees to pollen by sensing electrical signals given out by flowers. How bumblebees find flowers to gather nectar and pollen was largely a mystery until now. Scientists sits up, takes notice, have found tiny vibrating hairs uh, may explain how the industrious insects sense and interpret signals transmitted by flowers, leading them to the plants so they can gather pollen. While it was known that flowers communicate with pollinators by sending out electrical signals, experts were previously unsure how bees detect the fields. How bumblebees find flowers to gather nectar and pollen was largely a mystery. Now scientists have discovered that static electricity causes the hairs to move and helps the bees to find a source of pollen. Now, if I'd have said that, or someone else who's not a scientist would have said that, before these scientists said that, uh, and I've been writing and talking for years about all this electrical phenomenon, electrical communication that um, we're all part of, then we would have been crazy and, and to be dismissed. But a scientist says it, ooh. And all this is, is an example 
of what I'm talking about and I've been writing about for years, the, the way electricity and electromagnetism um, is the way that, we, that information is communicated um, that uh, allows the reality that we, um, we experience to be. And it's, it's the same principle as um, a computer. You've got um, the um, information going around a computer electrically and when it's all working in balance then the computer's working, working perfectly. When that electrical communication gets disturbed, disharmonized, distorted, you see the result on the screen in a distorted um, uh, projection of whatever you're looking at. Or you'll say, and or you'll say, uh, oh my goodness me, my computer's so slow today. Yes, because the information is not being communicated uh, to the optimum extent and speed through the electrical communication system of the computer. Now, as I've said, we, um, uh, as, um, if you like, human bodies, um, work in the same way. This is a biological computer. I even heard a scientist call it a biological computer recently. I fell off my chair. I've been calling it that for decades. Because um, the brain works electrically. DNA works electrically. The, 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 this is an electrochemical organism. And if the electro magnetism electrical is um, not um, working properly if it's disturbed or distorted or disharmonized then so is the chemical and so is the the, the rest of the body and we call that dis-ease disease disharmony and this can be um, disharmonized by um, uh, radiation by stuff in the food um, and stuff in, 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 in the water because just as the electrical and electromagnetic affect the chemical, the chemical affect the other way. And so um, when you look at acupuncture, what does it do? It's putting in needles along meridian lines of energy, which is just like the, the motherboard on a computer. And um, it's... Um, directing and um, balancing the flow of this energy through these meridian lines of the body so that the body is an electrical, electromagnetic, informational harmony. And um, these um, acupuncture meridians uh, go in circuits. So you might have um, a blockage in the circuit, which eventually goes through the head, um, in the foot. And thus, that affects the head because of um, the blockage in the foot. So when people say, well, it's stupid, that acupuncture. They're putting needles in your foot to, to help a headache. Well, if the blockage that's causing the headache is in the foot, there ain't a lot of sense in putting a needle in your bloody head, is it? I mean, ridiculous. But I see, arrogance and ignorance, they, they always work in, 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 um, in pairs, and so um, people who have not taken the trouble to find out uh, what they're talking about then condemn others who have. So we um, have a situation where if our electromagnetic levels are um, in Im imbalance, we are healthy. If they're out of balance, and it can happen for many ways, and it can happen through thought and emotion. Thought and emotion are expressions of uh, frequency which express themselves electrically and electromagnetically. Thoughts can be um, electrically measured, right? And electrical um, frequencies going out from the brain, going out from the body through emotions, can destabilize if they're um, you know, involved in fear or anxiety or depression they can destabilize the electromagnetic balance of the body, which then reflects through to what we call physical dis-ease um, in some way or other. Now, going the other way, if you have electromagnetic technology that's um, properly effective and used in the right way, it can emit frequencies which balance out and harmonize the imbalances, 
which take you from being imbalanced and diseased into a sense uh, or a state of balance and health. I'm, you know, not saying for a word that, uh, for a moment rather, that um, every one of these machines works brilliantly like every, every other one. But I've been on these machines, not the one Noel Edmonds talking about, but others, and the effect on my health has been fantastic and so quick, it's unbelievable. Often, not always, but often, in my experience, it's, it's, it's been so fast. And now the EU is desperate to ban them because the EU is just a front um, on the health issue anyway for the big pharma global pharmaceutical cartel that wants rid of anything that is alternative to its scalpel, drug, radiation, um, multi, multi billion bonanza feeding off human ill health. So when you look at this principle of electromagnetic balance, electromagnetic imbalance of the, of the body, this explains why you get more people um, often, these, these groups of people that get cancer around nuclear power stations that are leaking radiation, than you do in the general population and you get uh, more of uh, rare types of cancer because the radiation is impacting upon the electromagnetic field of, 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 of the people that are in that area and, and so you get more um, effects of that. Um, all this electromagnetic technology that is now dominating society is doing the same Having pulsing electromagnetic um, uh, energy frequencies at your ear all day long, I mean, that's not going to cause a problem. Are you having a laugh? And science, you see, says, oh, there's no known link between nuclear power stations and nuclear power leaks and, 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 and a greater prevalence of cancer. Well, those deep, deep, in the inside, they absolutely know that there is a cause and effect, and they know why there's a cause and effect, they just don't want us to know. But the great body of, um, of so-called experts are so clueless about the electrical, electromagnetic nature of everything, and therefore um, its cause and effect possibilities, that they can't understand how uh, being near a nuclear power station could affect you in terms of your bodily health. Well, what it does is it affects your um, electromagnetic balance and through that your health. I mean, it's so simple. But what science says is if we can't explain it, it can't be happening. All the time you, you basically hear that uh, mantra. So what has happened to Noel Edmonds? Uh, this week is a classic of the way the postage stamp consensus works. Um, you uh, squeeze uh, people's perception of the possible. You squeeze people's perception of reality and thus the possibility of changing reality. And then you turn them into um, not just sheep, but sheep dogs, keeping all the other sheep in line, as Edmonds has found this week. Um, and you uh, ignore all these other possibilities, not just in treating health, but in endless other things that could be making this world a much nicer, better, healthier place. Because it doesn't suit your agenda. That's your agenda. You don't want people here. And so when people like Edmonds and, and me in the last 25 years step off this uh, postage stamp consensus where woo, all the disciples are um, are there and um, you've got a question you, you never hear when you see these kind of scandals going on oh condemn him simple question it's what intelligent people would ask does it work does it work whether it's this machine or whatever does it work 
A doctor said it can't. Well, doctors don't understand what the body is, for goodness sake. Think for yourself. So, anyway, I'm going to be talking about all this um, at the weekend at the Brixton Academy, um, among vast other connected things. Um, and when you look at reality as it really is, as opposed to what we're told it is, then mysteries galore um, just fade away and become obvious in terms of understanding them. We might even um, we might even solve the mystery of um, why um, or how so many mainstream journalists manage somehow to summon the brain power to breathe every few seconds. I, I, I look on in astonishment when I read articles like that that they can manage it. Oh, I'm going blue! I'm going blue! What's happening? What's happening? You forgot to breathe again. Breathe. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're a journalist, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, how did you know? Intuition. There is an increasing attempt by different expressions of authority to tell people why they shouldn't listen to people like me and why people like me are not credible to be listened to, that what we say has no validity. Now, if that is true, then what do you have to tell people for? If, if they're just nutters, well, leave them. They're not a problem, are they? Who's going to believe nutters? Not many. The problem for them is that what we're saying does have validity. And people perceiving world events are increasingly realising that it makes more sense to see that these events are manipulated into place rather than they're acting or happening by random accident. And so... This problem is being met with more and more attempts to dismiss and discredit people who are actually uncovering what's really happening, as opposed to the movie script that we're told by the mainstream media. We've had in very recent times the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, feeling it necessary for some reason to say publicly that the conspiracy, because that's what it is, to uh, manipulate the result of the EU referendum, in and out public referendum, is not a David Icke style conspiracy. Why would he feel the need to say that? And we're having uh, academia more and more uh, coming in, saying that uh, people that believe in conspiracy theories have some kind of psychological problem. And if that's true, what is the problem for authority that makes it feel the need to try more and more, and we've seen nothing yet, to discredit those who are uncovering what those in authority don't want the public to know? This is uh, David Cameron. He uh, took a break in 2014 from selling uh, snake oil to speak at the UN General Assembly. And he was talking about conspiracies when it was about defeating the ideology of extremism. The peddling of lies about a 9-11 plot or that the 7-7 seven, seven London attacks were staged and the idea that Muslims are persecuted all over the world as a deliberate act of Western policy are conspiracy theories. The fact that Muslims are being persecuted all over the world as a deliberate act of Western policy is a conspiracy theory. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, 
Libya, Syria. It's not happening, it's just a theory. And talking about the conspiracy theory of a, a concept of an inevitable clash of civilizations. It's happening. And even though they're all true, ah, because they're all true, they have to be discredited with this term conspiracy theorist or conspiracy theory, which actually came into more widespread use as a result of a deliberate policy of using that term by the CIA to discredit those uncovering the uh, real background to the Kennedy assassination and other assassinations in the 60s, like that of Martin Luther King. We must be clear, Snake Oil Man went on, to defeat the ideology of extremism, we need to deal with all forms of extremism, not just violent extremism. Now, I'm going to pass that, not just violent extremism, through our Orwellian translation unit. And it comes out as, we must silence those telling the truth about what we're really doing. He goes on. For governments, there are some obvious ways we can do this. We must ban preachers of hate from coming to our countries. We must prescribe organisations that incite terrorism against people at home and abroad. Now, that's the front. A lot of people now, genuine peaceful protesters and activists, are asking why they are being prosecuted or blocked by laws that were brought in on the pretext of fighting terrorism. Because the answer is that that's exactly what it was, a pretext. You look at these anti-terrorism laws and they're so widely um, applicable in the way they're written, on purpose, that they can be applied against anybody. That's the idea, just to get them in. So, um, when he, uh, Cameron's talking here about um, extremism and terrorism, what he's really talking about is, in the wider context, as we move through, uh, targeting those who are uncovering the truth or protesting about government policy. Um, he says we must stop the so-called non-violent extremists. Non-violent extremists are people who are exposing through words and peaceful uh, ways what the government is and uh, the authorities in general are really doing. We must stop the so-called non-violent extremists from inciting hatred and intolerance in our schools, our universities, and yes, even our prisons. Intolerance. Um, intolerance for governments lying to us is what he's talking about. Of course, he says, there will be those who will argue that this is not compatible with free speech and intellectual inquiry. He should have added, but then that's the idea. So we shouldn't stand by and just allow any form of non-violent extremism exposing the government peacefully. But the right-wing extremists in government, they're not a problem. And the racists in government, they're not a problem. And he says to combat this, we must support the building blocks of free and open societies. So when's he going to start in Britain then? This is a man who is so blatantly manipulating and engineering through lies and suppression of the alternative to the lies, the European referendum, talking about a free and open society. And then, after 9-11, when you know, all that mayhem's taking place, George Bush, boy George Bush, said, again in an address to the United Nations, November the 10th, 2001, um, he denounced the emergence of, quote, outrageous conspiracy theories that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. Again, all that mayhem, and he has to go out and make a specific point about conspiracy theories, giving another version of really what happened on 
11. Why? Because the official story of 9-11 is so full of holes. It's a joke. And it's not about shifting blame away from the terrorists. It's shifting the blame away from the patsies and those blame for it to hide the fact that the real terrorists, those in the shadows that were ultimately controlling Boy Bush, were the real people responsible for 9-11. Then we have the Obama administration. Um, top azar, uh, Obama czar infiltrate all conspiracy theorists. We're nutters, right? What's the problem? We're not. That's the problem. Story goes, in a lengthy academic paper, President Obama's regulatory czar, Cass Sunstein, argued the US government should ban, ban conspiracy theorizing. Among the beliefs Sunstein would ban is advocating that the theory of global warming is a deliberate fraud, which it is. Now, if the basis of the global warming claims is so powerful and so obvious and so overwhelming, what is the problem of nutters challenging that official story? What problem could something that is so blatantly true, so they claim, have with a few people saying it's not? To the point where the US government should ban conspiracy theorizing. Why? Because, just like 9-11, the official story of global warming and what became climate change when the temperature stopped rising, is as full of holes and as nonsensical and as unsustainable as what happened on September the 11th, 2001, according to the official story. Um, Sunstein also recommended the government um, send agents to infiltrate extremists who supply conspiracy theories to disrupt the efforts of the extremists to propagate their theories. Note, what we're seeing, just mentioned it, but the confirmation goes on and on now. They're, they're trying to associate people who expose conspiracies behind world events. In fact, if people read my books at length, it's actually one gigantic conspiracy with many faces. Um, they are equating or trying to in the public mind extremism, extremist fear with People, people called um, conspiracy oh, pokes over the eye. People called conspiracy theorists who are exposing um, the government. In a 2008 Harvard Law paper, conspiracy theories, how appropriate. Sunstein and a, a co-author who was a Harvard Law professor, ooh, he must be clever, ask, "What can government do about conspiracy theories?" I've got a question. Why do they feel there's anything to do about them if they're so nonsensical and obviously so? Uh, quote, um, we can readily imagine a series of possible responses. One, government might ban conspiracy theorizing. Two, I mean, you know, pinch me. Ouch. It's true. He actually said this. Um, governments uh, might impose some kind of tax, financial or otherwise, on those who disseminate such theories. In a 30-page paper, Sunstein argues the best government response to conspiracy theories is cognitive infiltration of extremist groups. Why? They're nutters, aren't they? As I keep asking. Then, we've got the academic side. You know, God save us from academia. Please. I'll be a good boy. Just, 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 God save us from academia. This is a story this week. Um, believe in conspiracy theories? You're probably a narcissist. People who doubt, in effect, what they're saying, official um, uh, versions of events, 
are likely to be selfish and attention-seeking. Whoa. It goes on. Um, through a number of online studies, not many it turns out, researchers at the University of Kent have showed strong links between uh, the belief in conspiracy theories and those with narcissism and low self-esteem. Who says they found it? They did. In the internet age, conspiracy theories can incubate in quiet corners of the web. Ooh. But it may be psychological predispositions of believers which keep them alive rather than cold hard facts. See, what um, they do with so-called conspiracy theories and conspiracy research is they um, give the impression all the time that it's just a theory. You know, they're just sitting in a darkened room and coming to these conclusions. Um, this is just one of my books. Um, thin, isn't it? The, the, the background information, the background supporting evidence for the fact that there is a global conspiracy to turn this into a global uh, um, prison state. Unfolding by the day, by the way, just watch the news and, and your own life experience. That somehow there is no evidence when it's enormous but they don't go there because they go there they're on a loser let's have an open debate about this no they don't i um i was on a television program once with um an academic from um university of london i think it was and um this is a guy who for any anything alternative whatsoever is akin to him to garlic to a vampire he comes from the uh, the richard dawkins school of the concrete mind and he's having a go at what i'm saying and what have you um as the cameras are rolling and i said to him have you ever read any of my books and he said no so how do you know what i'm saying especially in detail I've read it in the papers. This is an academic that we're supposed to be taking seriously in terms of some kind of knowledge of what they're talking about. Anyway, this story goes on about the University of Kent. Over the course of three online-based studies, researchers at the University of Kent showed strong links between the belief in conspiracy theories and negative psychological traits. Um... Writing in the journal Social, uh, Psychological Pers and Personality Science, the team explained. Previous research linked the endorsement of conspiracy theories to low self-esteem. Now, one of the things that's building up here, um, and, and you'll see build up more and more, is not just a connection between those that can see conspiracies um, to manipulate world events. Uh, and terrorism, terrorists, but also the link between people that believe the government's lying and people with psychological problems. And this is this link's going to be made more and more um, strongly um, as we move along. And if people think that's far fetched, well, look what happened in the Soviet Union. How many dissidents against the Soviet Union tyranny, exposing the tyranny, ended up in mental hospitals to keep them quiet because they were uh, challenging the, uh, the official version of the Soviet state. Thus, they had to be crazy. They had to be mad by definition. Um, the results of these surveys, um, uh, where they ask people uh, to, if they agree with specific statements as to whether governments, for instance, carried out acts of terrorism on their own soil, yes. Um, the results show that those people who rated highly on the narcissist uh, scale and who had low self-esteem were more likely to be conspiracy believers. Who says? They do. Lead author of the study, a lecturer in social um, psychology at Kent, Ooh, again, must be clever, told Cypost.org 
Because conspiracy theories often refer to malevolent actions of groups, we wanted to distinguish whether it is a narcissistic image of the self or the group that predicts the endorsement of conspiracy theories. Note, it's never, is it the truth that predicts or accepts the in, and endorses conspiracy uh, claims in terms of explaining world events. The link they miss is the link between those who believe in conspiracies and those who believe, because they're intelligent, that governments and those in authority lie. And in terms of evidence, we only have the entire span of known human history to support that obvious fact. And then we've had people, I mentioned it in a video cast recently, we've had some academic who reckons he can prove that conspiracy theories are not true through maths. Note, truth is never part of their equation. Um, you know, we are led to believe and we are pressured and encouraged to believe that we must look to academia to tell us what we need to know about the world because they're clever and they've, they're at university and they've got letters after their name, mate. My experience, and if people looked into this subject more deeply, I'm sure it would be the experience of so many others, is that far from being the bastion of knowledge, most, and I mean most, academia is the pollution of intelligence because its range of thinking, its range of the possible is akin to the size of a pea. And I'm being optimistic. People say um, we must be sceptical. No, we mustn't. We must question. You see, there's such a difference between a sceptic and one who questions. Because one who questions, and people should question everything, including what I say. Let's see if it stands out. But one who questions is questioning in pursuit of the truth. A sceptic, like those very sad people in the sceptic societies around the world, their foundation from the start is that anything outside their pea-sized norm is not true. So their scepticism is not questioning if something's true, it's setting out from the start to try to convince people that it's not. And that, that is the mentality that infests and infects so much of what we call um, academia. And so we have this consensus between academics and politicians and journalists that somehow any, any idea that there is a conspiracy must be nutty, must be dismissed by reflex action and, oh, let's cut and paste that, uh, what's that phrase again? Conspiracy theorist, that's it, he's a nutter, he's a conspiracy theorist, that's how it works. And so you have journalists who are so, again, infected by the arrogance of ignorance that they ridicule and dismiss those who are actually doing the job that they should be doing, but don't as song sheet singers for the system. So let's just look for a second at the official definition of a conspiracy. A secret plan made by two or more people 
to do something that is harmful or illegal. Now, on that basis, how many conspiracies are there going on at all levels of society every day? The act of secretly planning to do something that is harmful or illegal. Weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that weren't. Classic. Now, a conspiracy theory is officially defined as this. A theory that explains an event as being the result of a plot by a covert group or organisation, a belief that a particular unexplained event was caused by such a group. So people don't conspire in secret to bring about the end that they all desire. That doesn't happen. Apparently not. Two, definition of conspiracy theory. The idea that many important political events or economic and social trends are the products of secret plots that are largely unknown to the general public. How much does the general public know about what's going on in authority and government and the banking system and the corporations? How much do they know? I mean, it's almost, it's almost in mathematical terms, um, almost indescribable it's so small, the amount that the public know about what's really going on compared with what's going on in, in the shadows and the meetings. But no, it's all a myth. And so what we're being asked to believe, in effect, is that governments tell the truth and thus there can be no conspiracies by governments to manipulate events by telling lies to bring about an end they want. And what I love, you know, people talk about conspiracy theories, and these academics and journalists and politicians talk about conspiracy theorists. Do you, do you know, for me, the, the, the strangest people of all are the coincidence theorists. They're the ones, academics, journalists, politicians, great numbers still uh, members of the public, who think that all these connections, all these um, names that keep coming up, all these organisations that keep coming up across a great swathe of different areas, all this information uh, showing the connections between apparently unconnected people, organisations and events, Is all a coincidence. I mean, I think that's a, a, a psychological flaw, you know. I think it's a, I think it's a case of terminal naivety. Maybe the University of Kent should do a study. It'd be interesting. So here we are in a situation where, for instance. War criminals like Tony Blair and boy George Bush and uh, all the people around them and behind them, where the real power is, told us there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, knowing there weren't. They lied through sexed up dossiers. They lied in public statements about the threat of Saddam Hussein because they wanted to invade Iraq because it was on the list of countries to be invaded, which included Libya, Syria, uh, etc. So it comes out, obviously, some of us conspiracy theorists said it before it came out, weapons of mass destruction is a joke. It comes out there weren't any. So there was, under any definition of conspiracy, there was a conspiracy to delude the public into supporting or not opposing the invasion of Iraq on grounds that were known by those that were selling them to be absolutely spurious. But then you say, or you hear, that 
any idea that there was a conspiracy over 9-11 is a conspiracy theory and it, they're all mad. It's sobering to ponder on the following. Not just the same agencies, but the very same people who told us there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq when they knew they weren't, were the very same people that gave us the official story of 9-11. And what does it say about alleged journalists worldwide? that despite what has been justified in horror and war, slaughter and suffering, on the basis of the official 9-11 story being true, despite all that, despite the same people telling us that story, telling us there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq when they weren't, I have come across yet no credible mainstream media investigation into whether that official story of 9-11 is true. Do you know, I, I kind of something to encapsulate mainstream journalists and politicians and what have you. I listened to an interview this week with uh, an investment banker. It was an investment banker who um, operated at, at a high level in the financial system and it just shows you how the truth is kept from people even in the system that he was an investment banker working in global finance for a long time before he actually realised and grasped how money is created the fact that money is created out of nothing, out of fresh air on computer screens by private banks, which gives them control of the entire financial system. And as those banks ultimately are controlled by the same network, it gives that network control over the whole financial system. If you go to my website um, on the home page, there's a, a, a video explanation of how money is created and the whole financial scam. Anyway, Eventually, after years in the business at a high level, he realises, hey, how money is created. He realises the whole financial system is a scam. He then, with others, puts an event together where he's going to explain the whole financial scam and how money is created out of nothing by private banks. He sends invitations to 1,200 journalists and 179 politicians just to come and see the presentation. Not one single one of any of them replied and certainly did not turn up. And these are the people who are ridiculing in their arrogance of ignorance people who can see what they choose not to see. And so what we are seeing and will see more of are attempts to discredit conspiracy uh, researchers. We're now having Google, YouTube owned by Google, Facebook, even Twitter's coming into it now um, in terms of censoring information or um, I'm try trying to undermine the alternative media in many and various ways. We're having um, this right to be forgotten law extended, announced this very week, where um, people can be taken out of Google search engines, in effect, uh, because they've just asked to be taken out because they don't like what someone said about them. And what this is, this right to be forgotten, is simply a stepping stone towards George Orwell's memory hole, 
where information that the authorities don't want people to see just disappears. Um, Google to extend uh, right to be forgotten uh, to all its domains uh, uh, accessed in the EU, it's EU law. Google will begin blocking search results across all its domains when a search takes place within Europe in an extension of how it implements the right to be forgotten ruling. The ruling allows EU residents to request the removal of search results that they feel link to outdated and irrelevant information, information they don't want people to see, um, about themselves on a country by country uh, uh, basis. And this is just the start. They'll want to extend this worldwide. You watch. And now, again, continuing this theme of linking, questioning the official story to terrorism, um, we have a, a, a situation where um, young people who question government or media may be extremists, officials tell parents, because you've got to get to the kids because they're the adults of tomorrow. You don't want them awake. Oh, my goodness, nightmare. Child protection officials uh, uh, have been uh, uh, criticised after warning parents that young people who take issue, I mean, wait for this, um, who take issue with government policy or question what they're told in the media may have been radicalised by extremists. A leaflet drawn up by the Inner City Child Safeguarding Board, I mean, how Orwellian is that? warns that, uh, by the way, to this child safeguarding board have a branch in Westminster? If it doesn't, well, what's it doing? So the board warns that appearing angry about government policies, especially foreign policies, is a sign specific to rad radicalisation. So if you're angry about a government owned by the bankers imposing suffering, austerity and poverty on a vast number of people, you are becoming radicalised as an extremist. You see the constant connection in all these different areas. The same theme is being underlined all the time. Parents and carers have been advised by the Safeguarding Children Board in the London Borough of Camden that showing a mistrust of mainstream media reports and a belief in conspiracy theories could be a sign that children are being groomed by, ex, uh, by uh, extremists. The leaflet says children who show a combination of these and other signs um, may be en route to emulating those who have been persuaded to leave the country in secret and against the wishes of their family, putting themselves in extreme danger as a result. You see how they're connecting questioning all areas of the official story with extremists, especially extremists heading off to Syria. This is the, the psychological uh, mind game that's going on to get people to put the two together um, in their minds. Um, local safeguarding children boards are mandated by government all around the country under the Children's Act of uh, 2004 and we're going to see more and more of this because they they want to shut down all questioning of anything outside the official norm and that as I've said in a recent video cast is what political correctness is all about the idiots that that, that extremists in uh, political correctness who, who seek to impose those um, uh, those destroying um, uh, pressures on freedom of speech that make people frightened to speak their mind and speak their truth they're just agents of government but they have no idea that that's what they are because they're idiots Bella Sankey policy director of the campaign group um, Liberty criticised the leaflet children should be encouraged to take an interest in politics and think critically about what they see in the media uh, not deemed suspect for doing so. But that is the idea, to make that the case. And so, we have had um, kids at school um, reported to the authorities and the police for doing things like going to the UKIP website, which is an official political party fighting elections in this country, actually opposing the EU. Uh, what was this other one? 
An A-level student was reported to the police by his headmaster, to the police, for criticising the school in a blog. Uh, the um, student um, was apparently, according to the headmaster, developing into an anarchist. I wonder if I should report the headmaster for um, developing into an idiot. See, what we, what we have here is a very simple situation. Not every last fact, not every last claim that conspiracy, conspiracy researchers say um, about the world is 100% accurate. And there are those who, who um, say things that I shake my head about because there's nothing to support it. But the fact is, the great body of conspiracy research, which is cross-referencing information and cross-referencing conclusions, is explaining why the world is, is as it is, why the few control the world, why we've reached a point now where 1% of the population owns uh, 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 around 50% of the wealth of the world, why this is not an accident, why this is not random, it's designed, it's a conspiracy to bring this about. Just as there's a conspiracy, the same conspiracy, different face, to bring about a police state so the 1% can impose their will on the rest of the population. And when you are selling lies to try to uh, persuade the public that events are random when they're all going in a particular direction. You don't want them to see that. You want them to see dots, not pictures. When your whole foundation of what you want to achieve is based on lies, then of course what you have to do is suppress sources telling the truth about what you're doing and exposing what you're doing. And that's what we're seeing now. And that's why this whole thing with conspiracy theorists is, um, is um, increasing all the time. And we're also seeing that more and more people are looking at these explanations and going, well, you know, they make more sense of the world than, than what, the, what the authorities have done in this. And this is why audiences for mainstream media um, Organizations are falling, many like a stone. And the audience for the alternative media is increasing, increasing, increasing. It's not because people are getting crazier and crazier and crazier. It's, it's because they're awakening to, to what's really going on more and more. And you'll see um, these um, attacks on the alternative media, people like me and, and, and many others around the world, the alternative media in general. You'll see them increasing. See, in terms of my case, they have tried for years and years and years to dismiss me and um, discredit me through ridicule. That oh, it's mad. Um, but it hasn't worked. It's worked with people that, that will believe anything and don't read what someone's saying so they can see with their own mind. But with intelligent people, more and more and more, truly intelligent people, not academically intelligent people, as they claim, which is not really intelligence, most of it. It's cleverness, which is very different. Uh, remembering facts is cleverness. Intelligence is making sense of those facts. Um, and actually seeing that many of the facts aren't facts at all. So they're trying to ridicule me, but more and more people are... Um, looking at, at, at what I'm doing anyway. I'm just about to start a world tour. I'm just talking to thousands, thousands, thousands of people all over the world, literally all over the world. So the ridicule's not worked. So what you'll see, and it will be the case in the, with the alternative media in general, is it will turn to hostility and to um, antagonism and condemnation and all that stuff. And um, what's happening now is summed up in this quote by Gandhi. First they ignore you, been there. Then they laugh at you, been there. 
Then they fight you, coming, then you win. Coming. Hysterical campaign in the media and through politicians to trash any idea of an elite political VIP paedophile ring operating in and around the British establishment and the British Parliament. It was always, like I say, going to come because the evidence that has been coming out since the exposure of the BBC entertainer Jimmy Savile as a record-breaking paedophile, the information that's come out since then has threatened the very foundations of the British establishment. And as that establishment involves politics, involves royalty, involves the media, etc., etc., British intelligence, then it was always going to wait its time and try to hit back and rubbish these allegations. And so this week we've had a pathetic uh, documentary, it says here, uh, by the Panorama organisation within the BBC, which has sought to trash the idea of a paedophile ring. It will claim it, it wasn't intended to do that, but that's what it was intended to do. We've had the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, uh, the Times, on and on and on it goes, um, coming out with the same stuff. And it is a classic, classic technique of disinformation and diversion. You are faced with evidence that, if believed, is extremely damaging, potentially, in this case, fatal for what you represent. So what you don't do, big no-no, is you don't attack the evidence that's credible. You don't do that because you're on a loser. What you do is you look for what you perceive to be the weakest evidence and the weakest um, witnesses, um, and then you target them. Ignore all that. Don't want to go there. No, no, it's too credible. We'll go there. And then, once you have gone there and uh, claim to have um, muddied the waters, if you like, then instead of saying, well, their, their waters there are muddied, is it true? But hold on a second, there's all this other evidence, like um, something like 30-odd uh, police investigations at the moment into um, allegations by police officers who have said that their investigations into um, VIP paedophilia and, and their rings were crushed and blocked and stopped once they got too close to big names. No, no, don't go there. They're former police officers. The public might think they're credible. Nor them, nor them. We'll go here. We'll focus on this. And once we focused on that and put our documentary out, then what we'll do, ignoring all that, is we'll claim, see, it's all a hoax. It was all fantasy. And that's how it works. And there's one other element to it. And that is you personalise it. Because propaganda is never complicated. Because complicated propaganda doesn't work. Because people go, I don't understand what you're talking about. It's simple. Real simple. So, here we go. We've muddied the waters here. Therefore, it's all a hoax. Nice and simple, right? All a hoax. Got that? Now, let's personalise it so it's all onto one person. So, we have headlines galore like this. Watson. This is Tom Watson, who's now the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party. And for people around the world, Tom Watson was an MP who um, asked a question in Parliament of the Prime Minister David Cameron um, about a um, alleged uh, VIP political paedophile ring operating out of number 10 under, quote, a previous Prime Minister, talking about Margaret Thatcher, in the 1980s. So um, now this hoax, it's, it's a witch hunt, um, is um, 
focused on Watson. So you have things like, uh, where is it down the bottom? I can move it. There we go. Um, about um, the, the witch finder um, general and all that stuff. And, and there's a, um, a quote here in this piece which says, um, do you accept police have no evidence that he, Leon Britton, foreign to, um, Home Secretary rather, in the Thatcher administration, um, do you accept police have no evidence he was a paedophile? And Watson's answer, that is not my understanding of the situation. And nor is it mine, because um, I've been investigating this for um, two decades, and I know many other people who've been investigating it. And the same names keep coming up and up and up and up. And among them have been Leon Britton and the former Prime Minister, Ted Heath. And I find it interesting that this hysterical campaign, not to question some evidence, which is fair enough, but to tr trash the whole thing, really started to move and motor after Ted Heath was named by police in August. Because, as I know from my research, going back into the 1990s, um, Ted Heath opens the gateway to something even deeper and even darker than what has come to light so far. I named him in a book called The Biggest Secret, which was published in 1998, not only as a paedophile, but as a... Um, Satanist and child killer. Uh, it was read to him, the passage was read to him within days of publication and in the years that he um, lived after that he did nothing and the reason is it's true and once Heath's name came up a prime minister and also as those in the shadows will know this gateway into Satanism and child sacrifice, never mind just straight murder, um, had the potential to open up. Suddenly, whoo, there's this big trashing uh, campaign uh, going on. And um, if you go to uh, davidike.com, uh, if you're not watching this uh, there already, you'll see an interview with Andrea Davison. Andrea is a former British intelligence operative who, in the course of her other work, came across this very paedophile ring and has been investigating it for 25 years. She is currently in exile from Britain, which she fled after being stitched up, not only for a crime she didn't commit, but a crime that never took place as a result of what she was um, uncovering. She had her house raided by police and 7,000 documents were taken covering her paedophile research. And she says in this interview, and I do recommend it, that um, she was told in something like March of this year that there was going to be a coordinated campaign between uh, the BBC, or part of it anyway, and um, national newspapers to trash the whole idea of um, this paedophile VIP ring because it was getting out of hand in terms of evidence coming to light. So that is um, what we're seeing now. And it is so blatant, it's pathetic. And I say this to people involved. I mean, people involved in trying to expose it and um, what um, are called survivors, people who've suffered the abuse, don't give in because that's what they want. Part of this whole campaign is to say to other people that have evidence uh, 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 about this VIP ring, see, this is what happens if you speak out. Eh? Better stay quiet then. So it's, it's, it's blatantly obvious, and we've had this um, campaign also directed at XRO, the um, investigative um, journalistic organisation operates um, on the internet, which has done a great deal in um, 
recent times to uncover um, this ring and to give a voice to the voiceless victims um, of it. Now, is every last syllable of what they say going to be 100% accurate? Of course not. For the first time, what you need to do is look at the constant common themes, the constant common names, the constant common descriptions coming up decade after decade. And it's an amazing coincidence, is it not, that the names that I've come up with, that people have given to me over the last 20 years, uh, the names that were given to Andrew Davison, the names that um, have come up through um, the um, reports on Exero, um, they um, are coming up with the same repeating names, and there are many other examples of that as well. Just a coincidence? How many politicians have passed through Parliament in the last 20, 30 years, and yet the same names keep coming up? Coincidence? Not a chance. Now, we're um, also having a, a tax at the moment on a man called Zach Goldsmith. Uh, he's being uh, um, urged to withdraw his paedophile ring allegations. He's a Conservative MP as opposed to Tom Watson, who's the Labour uh, MP. Uh, and this story says Zach Goldsmith uh, told MPs in November that there had been a cover up of abuse involving establishment figures at the guest house in Richmond, um, uh, southwest London. And he's now facing questions from a former Conservative MP and the brother of Lord Britain, um, the uh, Home Secretary, who's the centre of this uh, hysteria after he refused to withdraw claims made in Parliament about an alleged paedophile ring in his constituency. So Samuel Britton, the brother of the late former Home Secretary, said it would be helpful if Goldsmith clarified his statements by confirming that Britton was innocent of all charges. On what basis? When someone's name keeps coming up decade after decade, on what basis? And so... This is part of this whole campaign where you take a little and you swipe it across the whole thing and say, it's all a hoax. Oh, yeah, he's all innocent. This is the Leon Britton whose name turned up in government documents after he died, miraculously. This is the Leon Britton who was Home Secretary when a Conservative MP called Geoffrey Dickens gave him a dossier of um, alleged political paedophiles, big names, involved in a Westminster paedophile ring. And that document, after being given to, um, to Britain as Home Secretary, went missing. When this came to light in more recent times, and um, Britain was asked by um, the media what happened to this Dickens dossier, his first reaction was, I don't know anything about it. And then when that became untenable, oh, yes, I, there was a bundle of documents and I handed it to, you know, my staff in effect. And I don't know what happened to it after that. Well, you bloody well do. And how interesting that among the 7,000 documents that were taken in the police raid on Andrea Davison's home, part of the Dickens dossier given to her by him um, was among them. Then there is a um, newspaper editor called Don Hale, who was um, a newspaper editor up in Bury in Lancashire. He was approached by a very famous former British government minister called Barbara Castle and also given information, naming names in relation to um, this paedophile ring. And um, let's have a look at the um, story of what he said. Um, headline, Editor explains why he didn't publish Barbara Castle's paedophile dossier. Former newspaper editor Don Hale 
um, was handed a dossier at some time in the early 1980s about 16 high-profile political figures who appeared sympathetic to the paedophile information exchange, the big paedophile promotion operation. Um, the document was uh, given to Hale, then her editor of the Berry Messenger, by the late Barbara Castle, the veteran Labour politician. Once Hale began to investigate the claims made in the dossier, an astonishing operation kicked in to silence the claims. Um, Hale said that he was visited by the Liberal MP for Rochdale, Cyril Smith, notorious paedophile, now um, well documented, who tried to persuade the journalist that it was all poppycock. Isn't the current media campaign trying to convince the public of the same thing? Do you know I believe it is? Um, second, Hale said that special branch officers, this is the kind of elite um, end of the police force in Britain, said special branch officers arrived at the messenger's office, uh, showed him uh, a D notice. This is a... Um, uh, a, a law that just can shut you up if you're in the media without you having the ability to say I've been shut up. It's a democracy, see? Freedom. Um, showed him a D notice and warned him of imprisonment if he failed to hand over the dossier. Obviously, he said, I had to contact certain members named in the dossier and the Home Office uh, for their response. Each call was met with shock horror as to why I should be wasting my time asking these daft questions as nothing was happening within Parliament. Current media campaign? Um, when he said I explained the detailed nature of the information available and that I couldn't reveal my source, you could almost hear a pin drop as officials were unsure as what to say or do. Then came the special branch visit, he said, and uh, Hale went on, I was sworn to secrecy by special branch at the risk of jail if I repeated any of the allegations. When I met Barbara Castle again, he said, she apologised for the hassle caused and reluctantly admitted that she was fighting a formidable foe. Yes, she was. And it's a formidable foe, as I've been explaining and detailing my books for decades, that infests every area of um, society, politics uh, and media in terms of the current campaign. Absolutely, you'll find it infesting those areas of, um, of British life and indeed um, life in societies all around the country. So now we have this campaign to trash uh, the whole idea of a Westminster political paedophile ring for no other reason than protect the people involved and collectively protect the establishment, the system, from being exposed for the cesspit that it is. And how interesting that we have this campaign to uh, rubbish this whole um, story and this whole perception. And here's a quote. Actually, uh, she was talking to the Daily Telegraph, another one involved in this um, a campaign to discredit it all. This is Theresa May, Home Secretary now. And this is what she said about paedophilia in Britain in relation to this VIP ring. Um, child sex abuse allegations made against public figures are just the tip of the iceberg, according to Home Secretary Theresa May, who also claimed that such abuse is woven covertly into the fabric of British society, what I've been saying for two decades. Writing in the uh, Daily Telegraph, Mrs May said the public are yet to grasp the full scale of the scandal, which, she said, will lead into our schools and hospitals, our churches, our youth clubs and many other institutions that should have been places of safety. And you know why they are yet to grasp the full scale? It's because the media have refused to address these things. And over they've been forced to by the scale of evidence since uh, the uh, Savile scandal was exposed. And now that same media, much of it, is trying to rubbish.
those stories so that the public still don't grasp the scale of what's going on. And the victims, the kids now who are being abused and tortured and having their lives destroyed by these same uh, rings today that don't exist according to these morons they don't matter only the system matters this is what uh, May said in my discussions with older victims and survivors and their representatives I began to realise how abuse is woven covertly into the fabric of British society. During one of my first uh, meetings with survivors, one lady said to me, get this inquiry right and it will be like a stick of Blackpool rock. You will see abuse going through every level of society. And May said, I fear she is right. I have said before, and I shall say again, what we have seen so far is only the tip of the iceberg. Why didn't you mention that panorama? Hmm? Why didn't you include that in your stories recently? Daily Mail, Daily Telegraph, Times, and all the rest of you. Un freaking believable Noel Edmonds he found out what happens to you when you step out of the box or step off what I call the postage stamp consensus now if you go to my YouTube channel and look at a video cast um, trailer that I did um, I don't know two three weeks ago uh, about uh, an appearance that I made on a BBC current affairs program, you'll see me explain in detail what I mean by the postage stamp consensus and how it comes about. But briefly, it is the term I use for the mass download from Cradle to Grave of the perception of normal. And it starts when you leave the womb and your parents influence you on the definition and perception of normal. And of course, normal is only what people normally experience. Not everyone's normal is the same normal. Um, and uh, then you go into uh, what is bravely called the education system and you get the state's download of normal for all your formative years. Then you go out into the world and you go into maybe the professions like um, journalism or your know, politics or science and medicine and you take with you that base download of normal this postage stamp consensus and I use the uh, the term postage stamp because its perception of the possible is um, so tiny it is laughable and as long as you keep to that consensus then no one laughs at you and people think you're credible. Oh, yeah, because everyone's agreeing that their version of normal is, is normal. It's nonsense, but it's perceived as normal. Now, when you step off the postage stamp, uh, because you don't accept that that is the only possibility or a definition of normal, then the postage stamp disciples are all over you. Ridicule, condemnation, condemn him, and all that stuff. Right? Um, I've had um, uh, 25, 26 years of it, and I, I quite enjoy it. Actually, it's, it's quite funny to see how myopic and programmed people can be um, with such a narrow uh, 